joining us for this on-demand MDA Engage community webinar on mental health for individuals with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. My name is Michelle Barrios and I am the Community Education Specialist at MDA. This webinar is part of our larger MDA Engage flagship community event series which focuses on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and social opportunities. Be sure to visit the MDA Engage section on mda.org for updates on upcoming virtual events. Before we begin, I would like to thank our supporters, Biogen, Mitsubishi Tanabe Pharma America, and Amelix. We would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support, so thank you very much. Let's review the objectives for this webinar. Participants will learn how amyotrophic lateral sclerosis can affect an individual's mental health, discuss how an individual with ALS can talk about their mental health with a caregiver or loved one, learn how a caregiver or loved one can talk about mental health with an individual with ALS, review mental health resources and support for individuals with ALS. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Tara Charlton joined Columbia University's ALS Center as a graduate student in September of 2015 while complete, completing her MSW at Columbia University School of Social Work. Over the years, Tara has developed many skills and grown into several different roles within the center, including the clinic social worker, clinical care administrator, and is now the senior clinical coordinator and manager. Tara oversees the day-to-day -day operations of Columbia's ALS Center and team, and strives to provide the best level of care to their patients from not only the tri-state area, but from all over the world. Her passions include mental health awareness, workplace culture development, and health policy advocacy for those with disabilities. Julia Yasek is a clinical research nurse practitioner in the Division of Neuromuscular Medicine. Prior to pursuing nursing, Dr. Yasek conducted laboratory and clinical research in the Department of Neurology at the University of Massachusetts Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital with the focus on neuromuscular disorders, genetics, and imaging. She subsequently graduated from the UMass Medical School Doctor of Nursing Practice program and practiced for several years in both an inpatient acute care setting and a primary care practice with a focus on underserved populations. Dr. Yasek also has interests and training in paleo palliative care, healthcare policy and quality improvement and bring, brings these many skills to her role as part of the multidisciplinary care team in the Eleanor and Lou Gehrig ALS Center. And with that, I would like to turn over the webinar to Tara and Julia. Hello, thank you so much for having us, Michelle. I'm gonna share our screen. Hello everybody, my name is Tara Charlton and I am the social worker and clinic coordinator of the Eleanor and Lou Gehrig ALS Center at Columbia. And as Michelle kindly said, I am the nurse practitioner who works with the multidisciplinary team here as well. Um, for them to understand where that person is emotionally and mentally to be able to help them with a lot of their physical manifestations of their disease as well. Um, so ideally, every time a person with ALS comes into a clinic, a mental health screening tool should be employed to better understand where that person is at at that given time. However, you know, it often gets overlooked, unfortunately, because there are so many things that we try to fit into one visit. So we do think that patients should advocate or prioritize those needs depending on the situation and depending on their personal needs. So the first tool that I would recommend to PALS 
for talking to their health professional about mental health concerns would be to come into a visit with an agenda. An agenda is a good way to organize those tangible needs. I need a refill on my Riluzol. I'm My baclofen is causing me to be tired. My I'm having foot drop. Any of those actual tangible needs that someone will have to physically address so that we can have more time for open dialogue to discuss what's going on inside a patient that isn't as easy to decipher, you know, in a stressful, you know, and long and tiring appointment. So what we know to be true is that there are increased levels of depression and anxiety in people with any type of chronic illness. So it makes sense that a terminal chronic illness such as ALS would exacerbate these symptoms. While it might feel obvious to you that you're experiencing all these emotions, many of your providers are meeting you at this point. So they won't recognize any changes that might seem so obvious to you and your family members. That's why it's so important to express these emotions to your providers. These emotions wax and wane. A provider could be seeing you on your best day in a while, but it's not a clear picture of your true mental health status. It's important to remember that ALS does not occur in a vacuum. For many people, there could have been pre-existing anxiety and depression that went addressed, unaddressed or even went addressed, and now they have an added factor of this disease. The depression prevalence among PALS ranges in studies from 27 to 41 percent. And because of all these factors, it is especially important for PALS and their family members and caregivers to incorporate mental health awareness into their daily lives. So when it comes to actually putting a name to, to these feelings, to these symptoms, that is something that's highly personal to each patient. Um, you should keep track of the symptoms or what's changing between each quarterly clinic appointment or however frequently you go into your clinic so that you don't have to recall while you're put on the spot and talking to your provider everything that's been going on for the last three months. It helps if you have a, you know, emotion or feelings journal. Um, or even if you simply put it in the notes app on your phone. Um, when you are feeling something new, unusual, you have a change, for example, we're, and we'll go through a couple examples in the coming slides of these changes, but the symptoms of mental health concerns can range across a spectrum of issues. So it is important, if it feels important to you, it should be important to your provider and it should be addressed. So a very common, uh, you know, thing that would come out of someone's mouth uh, when they when they come into our office is, I have anxiety or I feel anxious. But what does that really mean? Um, so feeling feelings of anxiousness are hard to describe with other words sometimes, but there can be physical symptoms of, you know, uh, sweating, palpitations, tremors difficulty concentrating, um, but also, you know, there are the feelings of, you know, excessive or unreasonable fear of something or sustained or excessive worry when you, that you cannot control. Um, and I want to point out that these are things that are outside of the normal things that should evoke fear. There are scary things and we do have normal responses to fear, to um, surprise, to, you know, concerning things. Um, and that's normal and that's okay. But it's when we can't control those emotions within the normal, you know, range of um, emotions. And when it's changing other aspects of your life, that you don't want it to encroach upon. Um, so all of these signs can indicate larger anxiety disorders, a panic disorder, if it happens 
with the unexpected periods of intense fear or worry. Um, and PTSD and OCD can also be definitely a factor because specifically we can, we can uh, see that with familial ALS cases specifically, someone, a pals might have seen, might has, have seen this before. They could be re-experiencing this through their own eyes when they've seen their sister or their mother or their aunt or their grandmother already have gone through that. And so that can be extremely triggering for people um, with these anxious disorders. On the other side of the spectrum, we do have depressed mood. Um, and that can be anything that is, you know, a change in your interest in things that you previously found enjoyable. It can also be, you know, feelings of worthlessness or feel like you're hopeless about the future or having inappropriate guilt about something that wasn't your fault or you had no part in. Um, also physically, there can be pretty pronounced sleep disturbances, low energy and appetite changes. And so if these things are happening to you, you absolutely should talk to your provider because it could be a sign of these other depressive disorders or some combination of them. Um, and I, I know I separated the anxiety from the depressive symptoms, but often these can occur together or some occur at some times, some occur at others. And so um, I think it's really important to talk to your provider about these because when it comes to treatments or antidepressants, anti-anxiety agents, there, there are some that it's two birds with one stone. And so when it comes to treatment selection, it's important for your provider to understand the full spectrum of what you're experiencing so they can pick the right option for you. And outside of typical, you know, um, medicines, uh, I think that there is a role for medical cannabis and it should be discussed with your provider if you're interested in exploring it as an option. So we're going in the next few slides, we are going to touch upon a couple of resources that we recommend to our patients as well as types of therapies that we think to be extremely beneficial to patients um, with a diagnosis such as ALS. We'll also review a couple of patient support organizations and caregiver supports that we find beneficial and engaging. So here I have outlined two of the resources that I most often recommend to our patients. Psychology Today is an online portal to find a therapist, psychologist, social worker in your area that accepts your insurance, which is very important to people. These things can be expensive. You can narrow down your search by indicating the type of experience you're looking for. For example, a PALS may want to speak to a therapist that has experience dealing with chronic illnesses. And finding a therapist is a very individual experience and it's, it's not always easy to find somebody that you vibe with well. So one of the things I like most about psychology today is that each professional on the website has a bio that you can read through to determine would this person possibly be a good fit for me. Another great resource that I love is Talkspace and it's a great resource for some of our patients that can no longer communicate using their speech. So Talkspace is a comprehensive online mental health therapy resource consisting of licensed therapists whose experiences range from talk therapy to psychiatry to couples and family therapy and more. These sessions can be conducted over video, messaging, or telephone calls. Um, it's a very convenient option that comes highly recommended by medical journals and patients. Moving on to two of our favorite types of therapies, I'm going to start with music therapy, which is a clinical and evidence-based use of music interventions to accomplish individualized goals within therapeutic relationships by a credentialed music professional who has completed an approved musical therapy program. Music therapy interventions can address a variety of healthcare and educational goals, including 
promoting wellness, managing stress, alleviating pain, expressing feelings, enhancing memory, improving communication, and promoting physical rehabilitation where possible. Headspace is an organization that promotes mindfulness. And mindfulness is a type of meditation in which you focus on being intensely aware of what you're sensing and feeling in that exact moment without interpretation or judgment. It really brings you back to the here and now. Practicing mindfulness involves breathing methods, guided imagery, and other practices to relax the body and mind and help reduce stress. All of these things, all of these aspects of both types of therapy are extremely beneficial to patients with a diagnosis such as ALS. A lot of the time is spent thinking about the future and what happens next and what comes next. But these types of therapies bring you back, as I said, to the here and now. What can I do now? And what can I focus on now? And what will make me happy right now? I use Headspace too. I'm just going to put a plug in. There. I know. I know. <laughs> All right. So here we have outlined a few, but definitely not all of the organizations that are out there to help patients and their families with so many things. The MDA has a wonderful peer-to-peer -peer support network where patients that are going through, who are in similar situations going through the same thing can connect with one another. The ALS Association has support groups. While they might not be for everybody, they're definitely for some. Organizations such as CCALS and the Joan Dancy Foundation provide community support to patients and they can help patients with things like equipment and transportation and emotional support needs. These are great organizations to connect with outside of your clinic team. I know the clinic teams you only see every couple of months, every six months maybe, but it's important to stay connected in the months between these clinic visits. If you have questions about local organizations, talk to your local clinic and see what's out there close to home. So I want to talk a little bit about caregivers. My, in my personal opinion, they're the unsung heroes of healthcare um, because you help providers and clinic staff, you know, make everything happen um, for patients who need support. So I think that caregiver burnout is one of those things that we don't have great answers for, but we can use every tool in our toolbox to support them. Um, I think that every caregiver should look at things like the caregiver resources on IamALS.com. Um, and they even have things like worksheets, which I have included on the slide um, of just prompts to get you to even realize what are those needs that I'm not meeting um, so that you can better take care of pals that you care, that you love so much. Um, I think that another thing that caregivers should be aware of within their community is respite care resources. Respite care can be anything from I need an hour to go to a doctor's appointment of my own, or I need a couple hours to go get my hair done. Um, it doesn't have to be for anything life changing, but it's time for yourself so that you don't have to worry about your loved one that is typically dependent on you for certain parts of their activities of daily life routine. And you can, you can focus on what, what you need to for the moment. And in terms of a caring bridge account, I like to make this suggestion for caregivers when people are come up to you saying, what can I do? How can I support you? Caring bridge lets you give them exact parameters. For example, you need meals covered on Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and Friday. Someone, you can share a link where people actually sign up for those meals to bring them to your home and you're not getting things that you don't need, but you are getting things you do need. And it's, you have so many people around you that want to support you. Sometimes they just don't know how. I think, and 
lastly, I, I do want to make a mention of um, those who are members of the LGBTQ community uh, because they can be at particularly high risk of disenfranchised grief. Um, and so I, I do think that if someone is struggling with a loved one who has been diagnosed with ALS, um, please mention it to you know, the provider that cares for that person, that pals, or you know, seek care within your own community because that is something that we don't want you to experience alone. And I just wanted to add one last tidbit um, as we were putting this together and thinking a little bit outside of the box. One of the great places that caregivers specifically can find supports is a place like Facebook. There are private groups that you have to request to become a member of. So it is a small community of people who are going through exactly what you're going through. And you'd be surpri surprised by the support that you can find in those groups. Great point, Tara. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> we want to thank you all for listening. Um, and we definitely want to be, you know, supports. If you want to reach out with any additional questions, we'll definitely provide our contact information um, and additional links to everything we've mentioned throughout this, uh, this presentation. Uh, but <laughs> we find <laughs> that one of our best emotional supports are our animals. So we've decided to include a few pictures of our pets for you. And we also just wanted to mention that pets and animals in general make a wonderful companion. Animal therapy is tried and true. So if you have the ability to get a cat or to get a dog, whatever your family supports, it is a beautiful, beautiful support system. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tara and Julia, for your very informative presentation. I'm going to go back and share my screen. And for sharing your animals, I totally agree with you. Emotional support, <laughs> buddy, pets are the best. Currently have mine right down here. Oh. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for having us. It was an absolute pleasure. And I hope that everybody found this informative. And like Julia said, any support that we can give in the future, we are more than happy to help. Thank you. We would love to hear your comments about this webinar. If you have a smartphone, open your camera and point it at the QR code on a, the screen and a link to a survey will pop up. You can also visit the URL posted in the event description to complete the survey. Thank you again. To our event supporters, Biogen, Mitsubishi, Tanabe, Pharma America, and Amelix would not be able to provide events like this if not for their generous support. So thank you very much. If you have any questions after this webinar or any questions for Tara and Julia, please feel free to email them to mdaengage at mdausa.org and we will follow back up with you. I also would encourage you if you would like additional information to view the MDA Engage On Demand webinar titled Social, Psychosocial Support for Living with a Chronic Illness for personalized mental health support. Connect with your nearest MDA care center to discuss provider options. If you are new to MDA through this program and are diagnosed with ALS or are a loved one of someone who is diagnosed, we encourage you to stay engaged with MDA. You can do this by visiting mda.org join and completing a short form. This concludes today's MDA Engage webinar, Mental Health and ALS. Thank you very much for watching and have a great rest of the day.